Here's a little known fact. Women were among the very first to brew beer ever. How did the industry pay homage to the founding mothers of beer? They put us in bikinis. Look at this shit. wild. It's time beer made it up to women. So today, Miller Lite is on a mission to clean up not just their shit, but the whole beer industry's shit. Miller Lite has been scouring the internet for all this shit and buying it back so that they can turn it into good shit for women brewers. First, we turn the bad shit into compost. Now we feed compost to worms. Push shit out beautiful fertilizer. That good shit helps farmers grow quality hops which has been donated to women brewers to make their own really good shit. But there's definitely more shit out there. In your attic, in the garage, in your parents' basement. Send any shit you got into Miller Lite and they'll turn that into good shit too. Oh, so here's to women, because without us, there would be no beer. Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. It's also the show where we talk about this kind of bullshit through a psychological and snarkological lens. This is Miller Lite. The actress is Ilana Glazer, famous for her starring role on the, I don't know, 65th wave feminist uh, alleged comedy called broad city. She sounds exactly like her character on that. Scolding, youngish, middle-class white woman. Did you hear all the things that beer did to women? Beer did things to women. Beer victimed women. <laughs> and because beer victimed women, um, women now had to go buy back all that shit. The bikini posters. Yeah, beer put women in bikinis, right? Those women did not put bikinis on themselves. They did not sign those modeling contracts. All of them were white slaved. Oh, you didn't know that? Well, now you do. They were all patriarchied. They were all forced to do it. They were me too'd into it. And they didn't make any money from it. Totally non-consensual. Totally. So they're going to recycle all that shit and make it into compost and donate it to women brewers. Why? Why is it Miller Lite's job to donate composting material to women brewers? Bu brewers? Brewers? <laughs> In the words of one of the women featured in the commercial, it's so they can make good shit. You know, this is what happens when companies believe that hiring young, woke women is a panacea to whatever they believe their business problems are. It's not. This stuff is poison. Just like Bud Light, mocking their customer base, mocking their mostly working class white male customer base. This one goes even further. You know, Bud Light just irritated the hell out of everybody by paying that young man, Dylan Mulvaney, who's had surgery to look like a woman, prance around and get his face on a can. That was bad enough. But then the account executive, the 30-something-year-old white woman in charge of the Bud Light campaign, uh, I think it was her podcast interview where she mocked the Bud Light view, uh, viewership. Listen to me. You can see where my mind is. Uh, drinkership by calling it fratty and out of touch. Now, I realized that the commercial we just watched here probably was in the pipeline and had been made already before the Bud Light controversy. So... Uh, you know, maybe it's not fair to say, didn't Miller Lite learn anything from Bud Light? But yet they still released the commercial. Don't tell me that women are oppressed culturally. It is, there's no more hiding it. This is contempt. It is contempt for men, especially uncouth men. We're going to talk about that later in the show, too candid men, uncouth men. 
They don't even have to hide it. Just like black people don't have to hide their virulent racism against white people. They get to say it right out in public and the news media will applaud them for it. Now they applaud these women. They applaud these women for just basically mocking the hell out of the people who actually buy this brand. Miller Lite, I hope, I hope you tank. I hope you go away. You deserve it. Speaking of things left wing, let's talk about left wing authoritarianism, which is something that the very word shocks many people. And that, I believe, is because the original paper from, I believe it was 1996, on, called The Authoritarians by Robert Altmaier, did decades of damage to the social sciences and the conversation around this topic that topic being abusive political behavior and authoritarian tendencies. Robert Altmaier's paper is considered the gold standard. You can, you can see the influence across all the social sciences that deal with questions like this. His, his paper simply is unchallenged and unquestioned uh, until now. Robert Altmaier defined authoritarianism as synonymous with what he saw as a right-wing personality. For him, by definition, authoritarianism was right-wing. It couldn't be anything else. They were synonyms. Of course, the overwhelmingly leftist academy naturally bought this whole, and it seeped out into the culture, and it's now the mainstream view. Quick demonstration of how that is true. I did two Google searches. Look at the first one here on your screen. I searched for right-wing authoritarianism. Up at the top, I got about 57,200 results. Then I repeated it with the phrase left-wing authoritarianism, and as you see, 21,700 results, so less, less than half. That's just one small indicator. But what happens in the academy doesn't stay in the academy. It does filter out into popular culture, much more so now than it used to much more so. The kind of stuff that we were talking about at Sarah Lawrence when I was in school in the mid to late 1990s, um, the abstruse Judith Butler and Foucauldian papers that we students were writing and learning to read was not reflected in the mores of the mainstream left the way it is today, but it's a direct pipeline now. Well, a new article is out, new academic study actually, called Understanding Left-Wing Authoritarianism Relations to Dark Personality Traits, Altruism, and Social Justice Commitment. The authors are Anne Crispins and Alex Bertrams. In the show notes to this video, we have a link directly to the paper so that you can read it. I can only give you a gloss. It's a very dense paper, and some of it is beyond my familiarity with statistical methods, so it, it it, it is a lot deeper than what I'm able to share with you. Um, but here's what I got from it. Let me read to you from the abstract. In two pre-registered studies, we investigated the relationship of left-wing authoritarianism with the ego-focused trait of narcissism. Based on existing research, we expected individuals with higher levels of left-wing authoritarianism to also report higher levels of narcissism. Further, as individuals with leftist political attitudes can be assumed to be striving for social equality, we expected left-wing authoritarianism to also be positively related to pro-social traits, but narcissism to remain a significant predictor of left-wing authoritarianism above and beyond those pro-social dispositions. But what happened then? Still from the abstract. However, neither dispositional altruism nor social justice commitment was related to left-wing anti-hierarchical aggression. And I'm cutting in here. What they mean by anti-hierarchical aggression is protests against things like the court system, the police, any hierarchical order of authority. Um, is what these people are against. They don't, well, they say, of course, they say they don't like hierarchies and they will fight those hierarchies. Uh, but of course, once they get there, they put themselves at the top of a new hierarchy. Back to the abstract. 
Considering these results, we assume that some leftist political activists do not actually strive for social, social justice and equality, but rather use political activism to endorse or exercise violence against others to satisfy their own ego-focused fo needs. We discuss these results in relation to the dark ego vehicle principle. Now, I have a couple of questions. Why would the authors have assumed that actual altruism and actual pro-social desire for justice would correlate with left-wing authoritarianism? That's not an assumption that, to me, at least makes sense on its face. Genuinely pro-social people, genuinely pro-social people, not people who claim they're pro-social, those who actually are, they don't tend to endorse authoritarianism and violence. And th that assumption that they made, I think, might give a window into the base mindset of a lot of people who are thinking in this, in this realm. It's not only puzzling, it's, it's a dangerous assumption to make. It, it's a form of, I'm sure they, they really do mean well. You shouldn't be sure of that at all. But the authors were honest in saying that that's not what they found. They, <laughs> they expected they'd find a little bit of sunshine and lollipops with the leftist authoritarians, and they didn't find that, and they were very honest about it. And I give them credit because you can't, you should be able to, but you actually can't expect that kind of honesty from the academy today. So good for them. Other things they found, let me give you a few. Quote, while there is wide agreement that right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation. Let me, uh, I'm breaking in again. Let me describe social dominance orientation for you. Um, people who see themselves as um, uh, wanting to exercise social, social dominance and, and force other people to do what they want to do. It's a subset of authoritarianism. While right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation are valid psychological constructs, the notion of left-wing authoritarianism has been met with skepticism by many researchers. Next quote. Left-wing authoritarianist anti-conventionalism is assumed to not only lead to an intolerance toward conservative values, but also the desire to impose those progressive moral values on others. The desire goes al along with top-down censorship as well as anti-hierarchical aggression. Next quote. The top-down censorship dimension of left-wing authoritarianism is described as the preference for the use of authority, governmental and institutional, to deal with opposition and they strive to suppress any speech that is considered offensive and intolerant. This, this reminds me of what the psychologist, the psychiatrist um, who did a workup on Amber Heard talked about in the Amber Heard trial when she said um, institutional and bureaucratic violence. I think that's what I think that's what the authors are keying on here with um, the preference for the use of governmental and institutional authority to deal with opposition and to suppress speech that is considered offensive and intolerant. I'll just read to you this. You're not going to see this on your screen. The anti-hierarchical -hierarch aggression dimension of left-wing authoritarianism has been defined as the motivation to forcefully overthrow the established hierarchy and to punish those in power. For example, individuals might express their anti-hierarchical aggression by the endorsement of political violence to fight for social justice. Individuals with high levels of left-wing authoritarianism are thus assumed to be hostile toward the present social and moral authorities while feeling morally superior and endorsing the use of violence to reach one's own political goals. And finally, one other quote here. Contemporary empirical studies on the ego-focused correlates of left-wing authoritarianism are comparatively rare. The existing research, however, points to a relationship between left-wing authoritarianism and ego-focused traits such as narcissism. So what did they find when they got to the results section? The first study they did, because there were sub-studies, and this first one tested the correlation between left-wing authoritarian beliefs and narcissism. Here are some of the results. Uh, what they call antagonistic narcissism and anti-hierarchical aggression correlated strongly with left-wing authoritarian attitudes. But they found no correlation between left-wing authoritarian attitudes and altruism. This means that left-wing authoritarian people are not, even if they claim they are, actually altruistic. 
they found that Machiavellianism, and that's the willingness to use or exploit other people to serve your own ends without regard to the consequences of those, uh, on those people. They found Machiavellianism, of course, to be strongly correlated with left-wing authoritarian views. But they found the strongest correlation um, between psychopathy, conscience-free, absolutely conscience-free, and anti-hierarchical aggression. They found that an association between a social justice commitment and anti-hierarchical aggression disappeared completely when they controlled for psychopathy. It was psychopathy that was most strongly correlated. In plain English, my translation, what I, my best interpretation, people who genuinely believe in social justice as they define it to themselves, don't tend to endorse violence against hierarchies. But psychopaths who claim they are committed to social justice do endorse it. And they fool a lot of people. Um, you know, and we don't need... You know, I shared this study with some people on the Discord, uh, the disaffected Discord that you get when you join as a member. And, and they, you know, they said... Oh, water is wet. Paint dries in the sun. Do we really need another study to tell us this? And I'm with them. No, of course, we, we don't need a study to tell us that highly narcissistic people, highly self-centered people, people that we could accurately describe as psychopathic, yeah, they're going to be authoritarian. We, we, we don't need a study to tell us this. There is a lot of interesting data in the study if you are looking for the finer discrimination between different ego traits, different pathological traits, and that's of interest to somebody like me. I don't think it's necessarily that useful or important to most people uh, who aren't particularly psychologically minded and don't like to, to read the literature. I mean, what you see on the surface is pretty much what you need to know about operating in the world among these people. But uh, if you are interested in how this stuff breaks down finally, this is a good paper. It is very dense, though, to take some statistical. I'm going to get with a friend uh, to help me brush up on some of my statistical terms so I understand it better. But the one thing that studies like this, and, and I know they didn't set out to do this, so I'm not accusing them of not doing their job, but most of these studies focus only on the most dramatic and erratic of the cluster B disorders, the psychopaths and, and the narcissists. These are the ones that scare people the most, and they draw the most attention. But most of these studies don't attend to the borderlines and the histrionics in these social justice movements. And these people are the foot soldiers. They may not be as directly dangerous. They are the cult members to the psychopathic leaders. They vastly outnumber the actual psychopaths. They're the flying monkeys. And they do an incredible amount of damage, both in preparing the ground for this sort of thing by seeming to be genuinely committed to social justice, and in perhaps in some sense they believe that they are. Um, but I think we need work on them too. Just because you identify the psychopaths and you stay out of their way, you're not safe just because you're psychopath free, right? Um, we're gonna close up the segment here with a picture that was just sent in by a viewer from a drugstore in Pennsylvania, a Rite Aid. Take a look at it on your screen. There's one of those faceless corporate art signs that says, welcome all. Um, and I do notice, by the way, I do notice uh, that the, the faceless silhouettes, they do appear to be African-American people, of course, naturally. Welcome all, but underneath the welcome all sign, following CDC guidance, fully vaccinated guests may shop without wearing a face covering. This is today. This is May of 2023. It's from the state of Pennsylvania. This is covert aggression. Doesn't it sound on the surface? Doesn't it sound nice? Welcome all. Our guests are welcome to. It sounds nice, but it is not substantively nice, and it is not substantively welcome. It is exactly the opposite. We're going to pick up on that theme after the break. But as a reminder, we're going to be moving more content over to Rumble. We may even be going to Rumble exclusively. So I'd like you to please take a moment and make a Rumble account, bookmark it, actually make your account so that you can interact with the commenters on there because our days on YouTube are going to be numbered. Um, and um, we'd like to see you over there. So this move is going to happen. I can't tell you when it's going to happen, but it is going to happen. So please join us over there and we'll see you after the break.
can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more, and all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. Etiquette is an important topic to me, and I want to talk about why it's important and give some examples of what I think etiquette is useful for and what it's not useful for and how how it's well used and how it's misused. The first thing I want to do is give you my definitions of two different kinds of politeness. To me, there is formal or nominal politeness, and there is substantive politeness. They are not the same thing. I gather that most people are only aware of the formal and nominal kind of politeness. So I'm going to give you my definitions here on the screen. Formal or nominal politeness. It's speaking with specific words and phrases that are considered to signal consideration or respectable behavior. Nominal politeness emphasizes form over content. Practitioners believe that they are being polite if they use these linguistic forms, even if they have a barb or an insult hidden inside them. Now contrast that with what I call substantive politeness. And perhaps another word for this is respect or genuine respect. But substantive politeness is genuine consideration for the stance of another, taking care not to overstep one's bounds, not to speak to another in a dismissive or dictatorial way. uh, Substantive politeness is less concerned with forms and specific words and more concerned with respect and staying within one's own boundaries in relation to another. This plays out frequently online, the tension between formal politeness and substantive politeness. In modern society, I think is obsessed with formal or nominal politeness, and it monitors our compliance with this, at least in the online discourse. For those of us who are like me, tend more toward substantive politeness, and I realize that some of you are snickering as as you hear me say that, because I'm often rude on the show. This is a show. It's commentary. It's serious commentary. It's also sarcasm. It's also comedic insult. You know, I don't speak this way to everybody in every context in in the real world every day. This is show Josh, not real life Josh. Although there's some real life here too. Um, I'm more concerned with substantive politeness. I am not hung up on the fetishization of certain words and certain phrases that that signal I'm a nice person. In fact, I I dislike them intensely. But for people like me, those who those who are interested in formal or nominal politeness often say that people like me are rude. And what exercises these people, these formally polite people, I think mainly are boundaries, saying no, pushing back on presumptuous people firmly and without dithering about it or giving those people an out. To the formal people, the formal fans, this is, quote, rude behavior. It does not matter to them if establishing the boundary was necessary and proportionate. They cannot or will not recognize the passive-aggressive rudeness that often comes first with somebody who speaks in a nominally or formally polite way. Let me give you a recent example. Well-known gay columnist Andrew Sullivan had a social media thread where he talked about an article that he'd written 
describing what the queer and trans contingent was doing to what we remembered as the gay community. And he used the term queers over and over and over again. Another man jumped in, um, a straight man, you know, and I'm not saying you have to be homosexual to talk about homosexual things, but somebody who, you know, doesn't have the doesn't have the cultural experience as an insider that was informing why Andrew was speaking about this the way he was. I understood it. This guy didn't. He jumped in and he used a formal, formally polite technique that was actually substantively rude, and I found it audacious. Um, because we ended up blocking each other. I can't show you exactly what we said, so I'm going to give you my most honest paraphrase of what both of us said. He added a lot of I feels and I wonder if clauses to his response to make himself sound polite. But he was really lecturing Andrew on using the term queer too much. Never mind that the activists themselves that Andrew was talking about use that word themselves to describe themselves. So this gentleman said Andrew was, quote, needlessly alienating people with his language and that it was unfortunate that he was, quote, adding more heat than light to a very serious topic. That kind of response that this guy gave, that is what passes and most people accept today as polite. They don't even take a second look at it. We are trained today that minding and monitoring the tone, the vocabulary, and the affect of other people, especially minding the tone and affect of candid and plain spoken men, we, th we take that as normal. That taking a parental or a teacherly tone to say be nicer is normal in what grown-ups do with each other. It's not. It's not. It's new normal. There's a lot more of it than there used to be. And if you go back 20 years, you wouldn't find so many people taking this in loco parentis tone of voice with other adults. It just was not as common as it is today. So what was it about this man's response, his formally polite response, that was substantively rude? Number one. He's not Andrew Sullivan's father, teacher, or confessor. It's, to use their term, wholly inappropriate to lecture other adults on their choice of language. Number two, this man was unaware of the context that Andrew was coming from, and he didn't bother to ask about the context. He assumed, again, as someone who has not been inside the gay community, doesn't understand uh, these things. He can understand if he asks, but he didn't even think to ask. He assumed that he knew that since queer is a slur, and it is, that Andrew was, quote, alienating people and being mean. Number three, he didn't even think to question whether Andrew Sullivan might have had a goal other than making the greatest number of people feel comfortable. Do you know how many people really do believe that that is everyone's goal and it's the only goal you should have? It's so far from reality. He didn't ask, he didn't consider that Andrew might have thought it was necessary to speak really directly in this essay, in the language that the activists used to communicate something to those people who would be able to hear what he had to say. This is substantively rude this kind of correction and monitoring. And it got my dander up because I'm frequently targeted with that accusation online um, and, and not infrequently lectured on my tone. And no, not mainly for the times that I use four-letter words or direct insults. That's not what I get lectured for most of the time. I mainly get it when I say very firmly, no, you may not speak to me that way, and if you do it again, it will be the last thing you ever say to me because I will throw you out. That is what I get lectured for. You know, is that a warm and welcoming statement that I said? Take that tone of voice with me again, talk to me like a parent, and it's the last thing you'll ever say to me? No, it's not warm and welcoming. It's not meant to be. But it's also not rude. It's not an insult. It's not an assault. It's firm. And yes, it's icy. I meant it to be icy. Especially when people are responding in that manner to a social trespass that someone else made 
a line that someone else crossed and got away with because they assumed that because they sound polite, they got to say what they wanted to say. So I responded, and I couldn't get, I couldn't get my critic here to answer a direct question about whether he understood the context. And he said, this is the guy responding to Andrew Sullivan, that he thought someone of Andrew's stature and public renown and importance was, by default, asking to be nudged in the right direction, and that he was only fulfilling that important duty for the, benefit, the betterment of all of us. Excuse me while I fan a little bit here. Summer's coming on. That makes, that, that, that makes me see red. I responded to this gentleman by saying, you know, I, I, I copied his response and I said, nudge me and see what you get. Nudging is what mothers do to recalcitrant children who are still learning the difference between an inside and an outside voice. It's what you do to instruct kids. It's never appropriate for another adult to do this in public conversation. You are not anyone else's parent and you need to remember your place. This applies to me, but it applies to you and anybody else out there. Your place is not above your interlocutor. And what response did I get? Well, a third party then jumped in, someone who follows me online who likes a lot of my stuff. I'll call her Susan. It's not her name. And she wrote, he wasn't trying to be a jerk. Why would you alienate someone needlessly by being so rude? Susan doesn't get to read anything I say anymore either because that's my rule. You take that tone of voice with me once, you and I never speak again. There are multiple problems with this, and this is just one example. I'm using a recent example. I've seen it many times directed at other people. It's happened many times to me. It's not Susan's place to correct me. She just picked up the baton from my original interlocutor, jumped in and doubled down, and she thought she was doing something normal and justified. I wasn't rude. I was firm. Absolutely. Nudge me and see what you get. Signals aggression, but aggression held in check. Really? I meant to signal aggression, but I meant to signal that I'm holding it in check. This is a warning. If you go farther, I won't hold my aggression in check. I meant to convey that, but it's not rude, it's not insulting, and it certainly isn't inappropriate, given the context. The nudging and the minding and the mommying is the substantively rude and out-of-bounds behavior. And we've made a fetish out of formal and nominal politeness I think because it gives us license to be covert aggressive, which is what most people call passive aggressive. I use George K. Simon's term covert aggressive because I think it's, it's more accurate. Um, and we use it to get above our station with other people, to lecture them as if they were our children. It's mostly but not exclusively practiced by left-leaning people and women. Um, but I'm seeing a lot more left-leaning men take this, this approach as well. Women, as a general rule, are uncomfortable with or don't like direct and masculine forms of communication. General rule, not all women. Well, too bad. It's not going to stop. Men aren't going to be different than they are. Women aren't going to be different than they are. Women's modes of communication are not the answer to every situation. They're the answer to some situations, but not to everyone. And modern women think that what they do is the answer to everything. This is why they feel so comfortable bossing people around and mommying them in public. When, they, when these modes of communication get out of control, they enable evil doing by putting a soft focus veil on, on, on what is often quite disturbing treatment of other people and a cover for manipulation and for silencing topics that they simply don't want to see discussed. So I say, if you're like me, say no to nudging. Tolerate zero nudging. Push back on people who take a parental tone with you. Put them in their place. And hopefully do it in front of other people because they make sure to perform this in front of other people when they're doing it to you. I can't change the world. I wish I could so much. And I know some of you are sitting there justifiably saying, I'm glad he doesn't have a button to change the world. That's a valid point of view as well. Um, but I would like to see more of us reassert boundaries. You know, if this were an old 19th century Victorian novel, that kind of, of, of bossy, inappropriate intrusion into someone else would have gotten a response like, sir, you forget yourself. And that would have put an end to the conversation. That reminder alone would have been enough to back off. 
It's not enough today. Um, and, and formal, fetishizing formal politeness over substantive politeness. And l let, me, let me take it further. Let me take it out of just politeness and rudeness. Let me take it into caring, genuine caring, having a genuine interest in the well-being of other people. You can do that in a formal, nominal way, or you can do it in a substantive way. I make fun of the excesses of trans lunacy every week on this show because it is, as, as I've said before, I believe our worst cultural derangement, our most dangerous, physically and emotionally dangerous cultural derangement. The most aggressive and ridiculous clowns get the verbal razor treatment on this show and they get the mockery because they have it coming and there hasn't been enough of it. And I think that if these people had been mocked for their basically Bellevue psychiatric behavior in public in Walmart more from the beginning, we wouldn't be at the place we're at right now. I think our formal and nominal caring has actually enabled and encouraged this. So for those of us who do the mockery now and pay the social price, we're cleaning up the mess in some way for the rest of the people who mommy-toned our culture into she-males and girl hymns and making themselves into a sacred caste. So you're welcome. But underneath the mockery, there is actual tragedy. Transgenderism is tragedy. It's not ever healthy. It's not ever beautiful. It's not ever life-affirming. It's a choice to deny your very real existence, to give in to delusional or outright paranoid thinking, to act like an addict constantly, to chase a high for the rest of your life that gives you less and less each time you get it until you're broken or dead. And Ellen Page, the actress, is playing out her tragedy in front of the rest of us while Hollywood gushes fake tears about what they call her gender euphoria. If you ever wonder why stars die so early, think about how impossible it is for anyone who genuinely cares about these people to even get close to them. How impossible it would be for anyone to ever say, no, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to hurt yourself. It doesn't happen. Here's Alan Page from a few years ago. If you're seeing her on your screen. Here's Alan Page today. Celebrating her gender euphoria, or as Men's Health Magazine says, her trans joy. This is not a well person. The anorexia is obvious. Her eyes don't look right. She looks sick. She looks bleary. She looks tiny and hunched, and she looks like she wants to disappear. Is this trans joy? Is this what you want for your daughter? Is this what you want for your friend? What would you say if you saw this 30 years ago? before you'd heard of trans. Because you would have seen girls and women like this. What would you say if you saw this and everyone around this girl with the anorexia, including her family, was literally weeping with what they called tears of joys about her beauty and about becoming herself. All right, we're coming up in the end of the break here, but I wanna remind you, we would love to have your support our viewers help us make this show. We don't have sponsors. If you like what we do, we'd love to have you. You can join and become a member through disaffectedpod.substack.com or through subscribestar.com. And if you want to just make a one-time donation, we'd, we'd love and appreciate those too. You don't have to commit to anything. You can send us a one-time donation to us at disaffected.fm using PayPal. So go to PayPal and use the email address us at disaffected.fm. We'll see you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, 
or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. I want to talk about death. Death, dying, funerals, grief. Not everybody's favorite topic, but that's my specialty, is doing not everybody's favorite topic. Uh, first, I want to let you know about a much longer conversation about this if you're interested. I did it with Stephanie Wynn, who generously hosted me on her show called Some Kind of Therapist. Just plug that into your favorite search engine. Stephanie is a therapist. Um, she's great to talk to. She's not a woke therapist. Um, and she had me on her podcast this week, and we had a two-hour-long conversation. We didn't know exactly know where it was going to go, you know, as we thought, well, we're both uh, interested in, in psychology and in helping people overcome legacies of abuse. But we ended up talking mainly about death. And it's been five months, almost, since I left my job at Funeral Consumers Alliance, my 20-year career as the director of that nonprofit. As a reminder to people, um, the organization, think of it as if it were Consumer Reports magazine, but only for funerals. So we were a, an educational organization. Our job was to help people figure out how to arrange funerals, burials, cremations, that met their emotional needs, but more importantly, their, their financial ability. Because Americans spent, often overspend on funerals and um, have buyers regret about it, or they find themselves caught at the last minute not having done any planning and walking out of the mortuary with sticker shock, having no idea that what they wanted is going to run them seven, eight, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. It doesn't have to. It does not have to. That was why Funeral Consumers Alliance exists. But that is typically what can happen if you don't take death planning seriously and candidly the same way that you have other important family conversations about less controversial topics, you know. Um, it was really clear to me during that 20 years that Americans do zero death and dying education in their families. They pass no knowledge onto their children about what death is like, how we deal with it practically, how much it costs. Um, it simply is not spoken about. Um, but I've had enough distance from leaving my job. On, you know, I mean, I did resign from my job, but if I didn't resign, I would have been fired. I was the target of a woke cancellation campaign, mainly from within the organization. Um, that stung. Made me a little gun shy about wanting to ever touch the topic again. But I've had a few months now to cool off. <clears throat> and I remembered why I took this job in the first place and why it, why this is still important to me and why I want to talk to you about it. <clears throat> Americans, maybe Westerners generally, but I mainly know the American and Canadian mind when it comes to death and funerals. Americans, we aren't just afraid of death. We have a full-blown neurosis. I mean that clinically. I'm not saying people are crazy, but I am saying they have a full-blown neurosis. It's not just a little anxiety. It's a neurosis. We don't talk about death at all in any realistic way. You can open the obituary page of any newspaper and substitute, <laughs> sorry, I'll tell you what's going on in my head. As soon as I said open the page of a newspaper, I heard in my head some commenter saying, nobody reads newspapers anymore, it's got everything online. Okay, so swipe it open on your tablet, you know, be able to, be able to, <laughs> just never mind. <laughs> I really am becoming an old man. Um, you can open the obituary page of a newspaper and you can see 24 people there with pictures and their names and not a single person has died. No one died. They got lost. 
they passed, they passed on, they passed away. Occasionally they go home to the loving arms of Jesus, but they never, ever, ever die. Interesting, isn't it? When I first took the job at Funeral Consumers Alliance, no, this is before I took this job, I want to tell you how I understand and actually empathize with that fear of death. When I was a young reporter, I was a cops and crime reporter, which meant I was the ambulance chaser. I went to all the fires, murders. I covered murder trials. Uh, I went to the suicide bridge jumpers. Not going to lie, it was an exciting job. I enjoyed it. I did. I got the same kind of thrill out of it that emergency medical techs do. Yeah, you want to help people, but you also feel some excitement at having to jump into the middle of an emergency and do something about it. I didn't want to do this story. A terrible house fire had hit a family's house and four of the six children burned to death in the house. The parents and two of the children survived. And I wondered whether their survival was a curse thinking about how they would have to live with this for the rest of their lives. My editor told me that I needed to cover this story, and he wanted me to go to the funeral home that was doing the funerals and see if I could talk to the family. And I really, really, really didn't want to do this. It felt like a terrible intrusion. But I had to do my job, and I went to the funeral home. The family wasn't there yet, thank goodness. Uh, but I met the husband and wife who owned the funeral home. They were really lovely people. And um, I told them what I was there for, and I said, I, I'm sorry, I don't really want to do this because I don't want to intrude on this family's grief. Maybe I can talk to you. Um, and they understood. But the guy said to me, he said, hey, you've never been in a funeral home, have you? And I said, no, ex you know, I went to my grandmother's funeral, but I've never seen the inside of a funeral home. He said, do you want to see what we do here? And I said, yeah, yeah, I do. You know, because I do always want to see those things. I want to see what's behind the curtain. And um, he took me down a hallway, a long hallway, sterile sort of hallway, and door at the end of it. Opens up the door, invites me in. We go into a room that's a little dim. The lights are off. He closes the door, and he turns on the fluorescent bank of overhead lights. And all of a sudden, I'm standing in about 16 different coffins of all different sizes. And, sh uh, you know, not sizes and shape. They don't have that many different sizes and shapes. All sorts of different colors and levels of fanciness. And in that moment, I froze. I had an anxiety reaction. I know it sounds silly, but a lot of people are like this. I was like... <gasps> Oh my God, these are all boxes for bodies. I'm standing around among all these coffins. I had a little bit of that feeling that you get when you watch a horror movie that focuses on the gross anatomy student, the medical student who's studying for her finals down in the morgue uh, after she's done dealing with her cadaver. And then the camera pans up while she's sitting there writing out her, te uh, her test notes. And all of a sudden the bodies have sat up under a sheet. That's kind of how I felt. I, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously melodramatic it up big time in my mind. So I understand that feeling, but I know the feeling that came next too. The funeral director just simply kept talking to me like nothing was wrong and that this was all completely normal. And within three to five minutes, nothing was wrong and it was completely normal. And I no longer had any fear of walking through the back parts of a funeral home. I realized to myself, Josh, these are just boxes. They're just boxes. People die. When they die, they go in boxes. Big deal. Shortly after that, I joined Funeral Consumers Alliance as a staff member. Um, and one of the stories I wanted to write was about how a very large funeral home chain had bought up family-owned funeral homes and raised the prices astronomically. And nobody knew this. They thought they were still dealing with Smith & Sons Funeral Home, but it was really owned by a Wall Street chain. So I tried to do a consumer feature story on the weekend, an, an investigative story about what had happened to the prices at these famous family-owned funeral homes that, that had been owned by Wall Street for 10 years and nobody knew it. And I got a very quick lesson in how um, trade organizations and businesses are actually in bed with the state government regulatory agency. So for example, the um, 
the State Board of Embalmers and Funeral Directors, which is ostensibly the regulatory agency that's supposed to ensure quality service and adjudicate consumer complaints, was colluding with this big company to deny me access to documents and papers that were clearly releasable under open government laws. They broke the law. It wasn't a gray area at all. I mean, I, I know FOIA law, Freedom of Information Act. And I couldn't get anywhere with it. It went all the way up to the Attorney General's office when I filed a complaint, and the Attorney General sided with them, too. And two weeks after my, my complaint was thrown out, the local sales president, the regional statewide president of this company, was appointed to the presidency of, of the state board. So I knew what game was being played here. I eventually joined FCA after this experience, and one of the first calls I took was from a nurse, and she said, Hi, uh, yeah, we have one of your members here and he's expired. So I asked the nurse if she wanted to renew his membership and I got cold silence. And I thought, what's going on? And she says, sir, I said he expired. <laughs> and that is when I learned that nurses are incapable of saying the word death or died either. The next call I remember that came the next month was trying to resolve a consumer complaint. Jewish woman wanted her husband to be buried in a mausoleum space they'd pre-bought in Florida, but Jewish custom doesn't like embalming and it doesn't like sealed metal caskets. They want wood caskets. Um, and the cemetery wouldn't let her bury her husband there because they required embalming and they required a sealed metal casket as a condition of burial. So I called the cemetery manager and I couldn't understand this. I warn you, a little bit gross here. Um, one of the problems with sealed caskets, they're sold as protective. Uh, if you're ever at a funeral home. It's a casket with a gasket. It's got a rubber liner that makes the lid meet the top. Tupperware for the dead. But it adds about $700 to the cost of the casket, and it's a little $12 rubber gasket. Well, what happens when you place a body inside a quasi-sealed environment, especially in a warm, humid climate like Florida, gases can build up and actually cause the casket to breach or explode. Um, it's disgusting. I've seen it. I've smelled it. It's really, really terrible. So I didn't understand why the cemetery would want this, let alone require it. So I called the cemetery manager and explained this to him because I'm trying to get him to negotiate with me to help this woman out. And when I described the problem, he says to me, I've been the manager here for many years and we've never had that problem despite having had to move some of our patients over time. <laughs> did you hear that? I said, did you say patients? He says, yes, our patients. And I said, well, you have quite a crypt side manner, sir. Um, I was astonished. Even the funeral directors couldn't talk about dead bodies. Patients, right? Most people don't know anything about what they're buying when it comes to funerals, what it ought to cost. Americans spend more than $20 billion a year between funerals, burials, and cremations because we have equated love shown with money spent. And we've had it all taken away from us. It's been taken out of our hands. We don't see or touch death anymore. Did you know that 150, 160 years ago, there was no such thing as a funeral home? That's an incredibly modern luxury. We have a business we can call at two in the morning to whisk the body out of the house so that we don't have to de deal with it and see. That, that's, that never existed in history before the mid to last quarter of the 19th century. Your own ancestors, if you're an American whose family has been here for a long time, the women of your house were lying, lie, laying out the dead, washing the body. The body was shrouded at home. Sometimes the undertaker came, and when embalming came in, they embalmed at home, too. This was considered normal. But participating in the funeral as a family, hands-on, with the corpse, with the coffin, was normal. I call these family-directed funerals. Um, but people don't even know that that's an option anymore. And most of the people who called Funeral Consumers Alliance over the years were scared, and I used a technique that I call compassionate candor. Unlike funeral directors, I don't use euphemisms. I don't avoid telling the truth about embalming or what happens in the grave or what sealing caskets do. When people ask for this information, I give it to them straight. Many, and much more straight than they've got it from anybody else. And I hear it, I heard it in the responses I got from people. You would think, so, you know, some people would say, oh, I can't believe you would speak to consumers that way as if I were lecturing them or being rude at, at their time of need. I certainly wasn't. Um, but I remember one woman who summed this up and she said, 
when I called you, I was really scared. I didn't want to have this conversation. And you are the first person who has talked to me about my mother's death like I were an adult who could handle it. I feel a weight off my shoulders, and I realize after talking to you that I don't have to be this afraid even though I'm sad. And that's, that's what I did it for. That's what I lived to hear. I'd like you to think about funeral planning a little bit. You're going to be burying your parents, and someone is going to be burying you. But if you do do some funeral planning, don't do it in secret. I had a woman who called me once who couldn't afford to ship her mother's body back to the old cemetery across the country. Her mother's only wish was to be buried next to her husband, but she didn't anticipate that when she died, the family would be spread out across the country. And her daughter, who called me, was in tears because she was a single mother and she had school tuition to pay for. She literally couldn't afford to ship her mother's body from down south back to the cemetery in Maine. And she was guilting herself and crying over it. And, I, and what I said to her was, you know, if your mother were here right now, and she were sitting on your shoulder and she saw you going through this emotional torment, do you believe your mother would have said, Kathleen, yes, I do want you to jeopardize your kid's school tuition. I do want you to sweat the rent because I'm that important. Would your mother have said that to you? And she goes, no. And I said, well, I don't think she would either, right? So it's okay to do something that's practical. When I had a heart attack at age 36, I had to reevaluate my death plans. And from experience at work, I believe that planning with your family, not doing it in secret and sealing it in an envelope and not giving dictates from beyond the grave, but actually asking your survivors, not telling them what you want, asking them what they might want to, must be a part of this conversation. Um, I'm going to be giving some group classes soon on this um, on Zoom. People are going to sign up. I'm going to do some basic funeral planning stuff. Keep an eye on my site, which is joshuaslocum.net. Um, and on our Substack, which is disaffectedpod.substack.com, and I will announce those classes when they're ready. But I want to leave you with five tips to think about. This is what I call four-step funeral planning. Number one, talk to your family. Ask them what will be meaningful and practical for them. Don't give orders. Don't seal your plans away in a lockbox. Set a budget. Talk about how much your family can comfortably afford because if you don't, the funeral home will. Number two, decide on burial, cremation, body donation, or some other form of disposition. Number three, shop around. Yeah, shop around. In most towns in America, if you're looking for the same simple cremation, you can get it at one place for $900 and $3,500 at another funeral home in your same town, and you'll never know this unless you shop around. And finally, put it together on paper, actual paper, not your tablet, not your computer, not your phone. Make copies today and hand that paper to your survivors. That's this week's show. Thanks for joining me. I'll talk to you next week.